Welcome, so we are on our journey to simulate fire propagation in FDS. In this video I will demonstrate how I process microscale experiment data so that it can be later used as a target for an inverse modeling process. As sample material I have chosen polymethyl metacrylate or PMMA. The experiment data is taken from the condensed phase materials database that is provided by the MacFP group. This data is publicly available as a Git repository. When you download this notebook you can follow this link to get to the Git repository or you can have a look into the video description there should be a link as well. On the page of the Git repository you can click here on the green button on the right hand side to download the data. You can either download the data as a zip archive here at the bottom or you can clone the whole repository to your hard drive. I have decided to clone the repository. Here in the general information directory is a directory for the MacFP materials database. Back in the project route there is another directory that is called run reports. Inside this directory there are multiple Jupyter notebooks located. These notebooks are used to process all the different data sets. For one, the experiment data is pre-processed to form targets for the inverse modeling process and also notebooks are used to assess the results of the IMP. And as a side note here, I'm using IMP as an abbreviation for inverse modeling process. Right now the focus is on the process microscale experiments notebook, which is this very notebook here. In the beginning of the notebook a couple of packages are important. OS and subprocess allow communication with the operating system and also interactions with files. Plots of the different data series are created with matplotlib. NumPy is used for various computations. For instance, we could integrate over data series or also differentiate them. We are using pandas to read in the comma separated value files or CSV files. This allows us to make use of the data frames when we are working with the different data sets. The next cell gives us an overview over the versions from the different packages we are using. This is followed by a cell that gets the current working directory and puts it into a variable. The current working directory is the location of this very notebook. This is followed by a cell with general information for this notebook. This relative path points to the clone of the material database repository, specifically to the directory with all the institute contributions. Within this notebook, I do not want to use all the datasets. Therefore, I'm trying to narrow it down. This list contains the labels of the institutes from which I want to use the data. And in this list, we have the labels for the different experiments. Within this notebook, I'm storing data into dictionaries. I like to use them because to me it's more straightforward to access the information. In preparation of reading in the data, I'm creating a nested dictionary. It is organized by the institute labels and also by the experiment labels. For each institute, a dictionary will be added and this is filled with dictionaries for the experiments. Finally, an output directory is created as long as it doesn't exist. Its label is stored in this variable for easier access. Since I'm using this concept virtually in all of my notebooks, I can always access this variable and have all the output organized. The next cell provides an overview over the experiment data that is being used. With subprocess, we send this command to the terminal. This gives us the short version of the comet hash for this Git repository. With this line, we send this command, which gives us the long version of the comet hash. At the end of this cell, both of them are printed. I've also stored both of them here at the beginning of the cell. If you work with this notebook and a new version of the Git repository in the future, you are able to compare what the original version of the dataset was. This also allows you to go back to this comet to understand what may have changed. These cells here are just a check to see if the dictionary is set up correctly. We see here the institute labels. These are followed by the labels for the different experiments. I specifically like to use dictionaries because different datasets can easily be accessed by using words, like in this example here. First we have the institute label, which is followed by the label for the experiment. Compare that to a list or an array. There you would need to reference a position to get access to the individual datasets. So you can imagine if you have a multidimensional array, this can get complicated really fast. I for one at some point tend to forget which numbers associated with which dataset. However, if I've chosen the keys of the dictionary well, accessing the different datasets is relatively straightforward. Also debugging is much simpler because it's easier to understand if I'm trying to access the wrong dataset. So assuming I wanted to have access to the TGA data, here it is really straightforward to see that I've made an error. If I have just a number here, it is not that easy. Alright, now it's time to read in the experiment data. In this loop, we look at all the institutes that we had defined up top. The institute labels are the first level keys in the dictionary. We can access them by using the list command on the dictionary. Next, the list is created with all the different experiment setups per institute. In this next loop here, we are looking at all the different experiment labels. Just for convenience, this variable here is created, which will produce shorter lines later on in the script. A path is created to the experiment data by a given institute by combining the experiment root with the institute label. The institute labels that we have used in the dictionary are the same labels that are used for the directory labels. For example, one of the created paths could point into the NIST directory. Inside there is a couple of files. Let's have a look at the general structure of their labels. Different blocks of information are separated by underscores. The first block is the institute label. The second block is the experiment setup. The third block can be a little bit different. For example, in the microscale tests, the next block is the atmosphere, which is followed by the heating rate. In the cone calorimeter, however, we only see the external flux. 
The last block of the label is always a repetition of the experiment. For instance, the TGA experiment was repeated five times. We can therefore use the keys of the dictionary to build the first part of the file label. I am using this to find the files we are looking for. First a list is created with all the file names in the directory. Then we check each file label if it contains the institute and the experiment setup. If that is the case, we would like to extract the heating rate to organize the data even further. Here we can make use of the file structure that every block of information is separated by an underscore. With split, a list is created where each block is its own entry. From this list we take the second item from the end. Just briefly have a look at the file labels again. Separated by the underscores, the second item from the end is 10 Kelvin for instance here. Extracting the heating rates becomes more important later on when we are reading in the data from Sandia. Because there we have two different heating rates, 10 Kelvin per minute and 50 Kelvin per minute. The heating rate label is used to add a new empty dictionary to our data collection. However, since we are looping over all the files, we want to prevent the empty dictionary to be overwritten with another empty dictionary. This if condition checks if the key already exists and only adds the dictionary if it doesn't. The data is then further organized by repetition. For this we would like to build the respective keys dynamically. First splitting the file labels again around the underscores. Then we take the last element in this list. Looking at the file labels again, this means there is let's say 5.csv as the last element. We can split that again now around the period. With that we get a list that contains as first element the 5 and the second element CSV. So if you take that first element we only get the number 5 for example. This number is then inserted here to create a human readable dictionary key. Now the path is completed that we started above by adding the file label to it. We can now read the CSV file as a pandas data frame. The first parameter here is the file label. The second parameter is the header line. This is a line in the file that contains all the column headers. The third parameter here is a list of all the lines that are to be skipped while reading in the file. Finally, this data frame is then stored in the dictionary organized by the experiment condition and the repetition. If we have a brief look at one of these files, we see that in the first line there is a different column headers, the second line contains the units and is skipped when reading in the data. At the end of the cell, one of the data frames is presented to check if everything worked. The dot head shows the first five lines in the data frame. This is also a nice demonstration of using the labels to access the different data sets. Let's start now with the processing of the experiment data. Here in the beginning I will go a little bit more into detail how the data is processed. For the data sets further down in the notebook I will not go into so much detail because you will realize that it's essentially always a copy of the thing that came before. We start out with the TGA data from NIST. Here is the residual mass and I just want to see how the data looks like. In the beginning a couple of variables are defined for the institute, the experiment setup and the experiment condition. With that I can then access the datasets from the dictionary. So in this example here we get from NIST the TGA data for the 10 Kelvin per minute heating rate. Now we want to get access to the different repetitions. So from the keys in this dictionary we create a list which is the different repetition labels. Then for each of the repetition labels we get the respective dataset. This dataset then corresponds to the data frame we created here. If the column headers are single strings we can use the dot notation here to access the respective column. That is then also why I like to use the data frames because then I can again type in the word of the column or of the data series that I would like to access. With that we create a plot of the residual sample mass against the temperature. We can furthermore leverage the fact that the repetition labels were chosen relatively well so that we can take the key from the dictionary and just replace the underscore with a point and a space to use it as a label for the individual data series. Then comes some metadata for the plots for instance having grid lines in the background or the axis labels. Now a path is set up to save the plot as an image. For that we can then access the variable for the output directory that was created up top. In this output directory I have manually created a directory for the plots. Now for the image label I am using the variables created up top for the institute, the experiment and the condition and then add what the plot is about, here the residual mass. This line saves the plot for this file label and with that resolution of 320 dpi. And finally the plot is shown here. Next I would like to check the heating rate to see how well the experiment conditions were met. So you see already that the top part is basically always copied over so that I can easily access the individual information. Here I have a manual definition of a plot that is showing me the target data, so basically the 10 Kelvin per minute. This code block determines the heating rates for each of the repetitions, which are then plotted in the next step. So first the time is transformed from seconds to minutes and then with the NumPy package we can compute the gradient of the temperature over time. 
that gives us the heating rate and then we can plot the heating rate against time. So we see here then that the apparatus takes a couple of minutes to reach the desired heating rate but afterwards is able to keep it relatively constant. And this is true for all the repetitions. Now we start with the processing and compute the normalized residual masses for each of the repetitions. A new series of x values is created for the temperature with a 1 Kelvin spacing. From the experiment data I have determined a minimum and a maximum temperature in which I want to have the temperature range. So we can see here that all the experiments start at roughly 300 Kelvin and end at 1080 or so Kelvin. Since in the end not so much is happening anymore, I decided to cut off 200 Kelvin at the end. Now I determine the range and with Linspace I create the new array. Here I set up a dictionary to collect the processed information. The first element in the dictionary is the new temperature. This loop goes over all the repetitions, extracts the sample mass and also finds the maximum value of this data series. Now the mass data series is interpolated to the new temperatures and also at the same time it is normalized by the maximum mass. These new y values are then added into the dictionary and the repetition is given as a label. Here I copy the normalized masses into a list. Then I can compute the average for each row in this list, so basically for each time step. In some cases the values can be below zero. I would like to avoid that and exchange them with 0.0. .0. This average data is then added to the dictionary above, getting the label average. Then this dictionary is transformed into a pandas data frame. A new file path is created so that we can write the data frame as a CSV file to the disk. The separator is explicitly set to a comma and the encoding is UTF-8. So from the data frame the dot tail gives us the last five lines of the data frame. So we have here the new temperatures, we have the values of each of the repetitions and we have the average. These average values have been computed across these lines here. So that means this line produces this average, this line produces this average and so forth. Here we visualize the data from the data frame above. So all the headers of the data frame are transferred into a list for the column headers. If in the column header we find the string rep, we will create a plot. So that is basically used to distinguish between the column that is temperature or repetition or average. Because I only want to plot the repetitions against temperature and then the average later on extra. The x data is the temperature and it is also here converted to degrees Celsius. And then the data series of the different repetitions are chosen for the y values. The column labels are created as we did before. The average data is then here plotted manually so that we can easily give it a different line style and a different color. We have here the normalized residual mass starting at 1, 100% of the sample is still left over. After we heat it up at some point some reaction starts and the material is consumed until we have some residue left. We also see that the repeatability for all the tests is relatively good. So in this cell I computed the normalized residual mass against time. So it's essentially the same thing just that we look at the time instead of the temperature. So next up is the MCC data from NIST. Again we start with creating an overview over the data provided from NIST MCC the 60 Kelvin per minute. Two repetitions have been provided and it looks the reproducibility is quite good. Here we have a look at the heating rate and it also seems that it is able to hit the heating rate quite well. Here same as above the experiment data is mapped to a new temperature range. Again we create the list and compute the average while cutting values that are below zero. Transformed into a data frame a file label is given and the data is written to disk and a check for the result. Here we see for instance that repetition 2 got below 0 and for the average it is kept at 0. Then again we plot the data series here to get a visual representation of the process data. And then again as above we have also mapped the data against time but it's basically always the same thing. With the TGA data from above and also the MCC data we are now able to compute an average heat of combustion of the material. So from the normalized residual mass from the TGA data the average data series I'm taking the last value to determine the fraction of residue that is left after the experiment. The amount of material that is left over after the experiment is used in FTS later on as the new material parameter. With that we can determine how much of the material is then transformed into a gaseous species by taking 1 minus the residue. Now from the MCC data we take the average and integrate it over time. This multiplied with the percentage of material that is transformed into a gas will give us the average heat of combustion of the gaseous species being released. The information is then printed here below. And also for convenience I have here directly produced the input lines for FDS for the material definitions. How much of my material is formed into a new species and what is the label of the new species and the same for the residue. So when I later set up the FDS input file I can just copy these four lines over. Next up is the experiment data from Sandia. We start with the TGA 10 Kelvin per minute and look at the residual mass. But you see here already these are the same cells from above just copied down. The only thing I need to change is then just the institute label here. So we have then here the plots for the two repeats. 
repetitions. Then again the heating rate is determined. Unfortunately here the heating rate is not so accurate. I'm not an experimentalist so I'm not sure what the reason is here. What I can say is that the experiment apparatus is definitely a different one. Here this is a Netsch F3 Jupiter for Sandia while NIST used a Netsch F1. Okay then we compute again the normalized residual masses for these data sets and generate the respective plot. Next is the 50 Kelvin per minute TJ data set from Sandia. Again we look at the residual masses and determine the heating rate, which here is unfortunately quite off. But then you see it's always the same. Now we have the residual masses again. Next up is the TGA data from Human. They only provided a single repetition for each experiment condition. However, they provided a wider range of heating rates. This then leads here to a slight change in the setup of the individual code cells. I commented out the heating condition and now I'm looping over all the heating conditions that are available. And then for each of the heating condition a plot is created and saved. Also a slight change here. All the different target data sets are here predefined for easier plotting later on. Interesting to see here is that no matter how high the heating rate is, it is always matched perfectly. Again, I'm not an experimentalist, but I have my doubts that you can hit the heating rates so good. Like specifically looking here in the end at 50 Kelvin per minute or even 100 Kelvin per minute. I'm under the impression that the wrong data series for the temperatures has been provided here. This looks more like the target value of the apparatus and not the actual measured temperature. But anyway, it is what it is. So then the normalized residual masses, obviously without averaging because it's only one data series. Finally, the normalized residual mass against the temperature is computed for all the different data series, but it's all the same thing as before, and now the files are then saved to disk. Here in the end is an overview over one of the data frames. This concludes the section of processing the microscale experiment data. In the next video we will discuss how we set up microscale simulations in FDS. If you found this video helpful, please leave a like, otherwise have a nice day. Bye!